indeed. Very tough. Brendan Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I hope that I might get a chance later in this debate to talk about the uh, working for families components of part two of this bill. But I wanted to focus. I hope so too. And, uh, but I wanted to focus my first comments around the changes to KiwiSaver and note the press release from the Minister of Finance and the Minister and the Chair about how changes to KiwiSaver are going to encourage a higher level of private savings. That's the opening line of the media statement accompanying the budget yesterday. And I'd like to refer to the regulatory impact statement prepared by the Treasury and the IRD analysing this bill. And note this comment on the opening page of the RIS. Our analysis of the options is therefore dependent on behavioural assumptions for which there is minimal empirical evidence about individuals' and employers' responses to changes in saving incentives and other regulatory requirements. In other words, Treasury and the IRD are saying there is no empirical evidence about the changes being made in this bill and what the impact it will provide in terms of the savings, overall savings, of New Zealanders. And I note further their comments how KiwiSaver is less than five years old and since its launch there have been several significant changes to contribution requirements, most of them through this government, and how KiwiSaver has not had the time or any period of stability in which to establish its core products. And this uncertainty and unpredictability is not helpful either to the industry or savers. That's Treasury, that's IRD commenting on this bill. And officials never highlight their comments. They don't put them in strong language, but read the tone of that. They're saying they have severe doubts about this bill and its impact on national savings. And I further want to quote from this on page five of the regulatory impact statement. They are saying the objectives for any changes to KiwiSaver are to help return the Crown to surplus sooner by reducing the fiscal costs of KiwiSavers and to continue to encourage increased levels of private household savings. Each of these options for change was assessed against a matrix of criteria, but then it says this. In making this assessment, the strongest weight was given to measures which reduced fiscal costs. So they've just really put to one side the questions around what impacts the cuts to KiwiSaver are going to have to KiwiSaver and overall savings by New Zealanders. Not the Crown savings, but the savings regime of New Zealanders. They go further and analysis what will be the impact of lowering the minimum tax credit, the halving in fact of the tax credit that until next year New Zealanders have enjoyed under KiwiSaver. They say this, quote, it will make KiwiSaver less attractive. They say it may mean that fewer savings are directed from other forms of savings. They say this in respect of increasing the employer contribution uh, upwards to uh, 3%, that the increase in employer costs are likely to lead to reduced business profitability in the short term and lower wages over the longer term. And if we wanted evidence of that, look at TV1 News last night and Alistair Thompson from the Northern Employers saying employees will be required to meet this out of any wage increase when they're facing 5% inflation at the moment. They're going to be told, sorry, the government's told us we've got to contribute more. You are going to pay the cost. What's that going to say to people who are living on the margins? What is it going to say to them about encouraging them investing in their future, putting something aside? The whole damn basis of this budget was supposed to be stimulating savings, and here's Treasury and IRD saying that we're going to see it come at the cost of lower wages. Where is the gain in that? And then uh, to finally comment from the FIS it's on the, on the, the uh, increase in employee contribution rates to 3%, how that may mean to some uh, stop contributing. So there's the analysis of Treasury and the IRD 
in respect of this bill, saying, in essence, that there are some high risks around it actually discouraging people from savings when we know, and this government puts it in the centre, Mr Chair, Mr Chair, Mr Chair, we know, Mr Chair. Uh, look, Mr. don't Ch yell at me. <laughs> I'm allowed to ponder to make sure I get it right. Thank you. Brendan Byrne. Thank you, Mr Chair. I promise, Mr Chair, I will never shout at you again because you are a chair who makes excellent judgments almost all of the time. I wanted to make reference to, to make reference to another aspect of this budget and the fact that the supposedly we are trying to get to a position of better national savings. But, of course, the budget figures show this, that instead of seeing a decrease in the growth of national debt, that is that money borrowed by New Zealanders overseas and repatriated by companies resident, uh, sorry, making uh, investments here and repatriating profits, that instead of seeing a decrease in our overall national debt, this budget's figures actually show an increase from this year's minus 78 per cent of GDP to next year, 80, uh, sorry, 2015, 85 per cent of GDP. So where is the game? Where is the game for us? And I note the comments of Ganesh Nana from Burl this morning, who analysed the budget and looked at the fact that in the text of it there were some 19 references to debt, some 19 references to debt, and two references to exports. Two references to exports. This whole focus is on cutting, not growing. Cutting, not growing. And I'd like to refer to the comments just received from the Manufacturers and Exporters Association saying this, that the budget has targeted balancing the books but missed out on balancing the economy by sparking growth in the tradable sector. The budget focused on cutting costs through to cuts to KiwiSaver and working for families, says the national organisation based in Christchurch, but representing nationally manufacturers and exporters, saying there are cuts to the costs of Kiwi savers and families, working for families, but add little detail on how to increase growth or shift the balance of the economy towards savings and exports, as the government has talked about. So we're getting the rhetoric about growing the productive sector growing the economy, but in fact what it's coming back to is the traditional Tory method of cutting and cutting back on those who are least able to contribute to cuts, working families, people who've been encouraged, supported, told they need to save, encouraged into that through the, uh, the KiwiSaver regime, and yet nothing there to encourage them. In fact, absolutely the opposite. And we will see, I'm sure, a downturn in people joining KiwiSaver and contributing to KiwiSaver, and that is to our net cost as a nation. I'd like to comment further around the SOE sales and say this, that not only do I believe we will see asset sales, if there is a, a national government re-elected, from the SOEs, but also, I note, in the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Act, the uh, capacity, the capacity for sale of assets held currently by the Christchurch City Council. And this has been aerated publicly over the last couple of weeks. Minister Brownlee confirmed that the capacity is there. It is included in the powers of the SARA for the sales of Christchurch's $2.2 billion worth of assets, including our power company, Orion, including our port, including our airport. And I say this to the government. You, if you look at those assets and start to look at them in terms of sale, you will be doing a disservice which will completely undermine the efforts made on the other side of the ledger in terms of the recovery of Christchurch. We have acknowledged the government has stepped up and is putting in place a regime to rebuild Christchurch. That is welcome. But I put this rider on it. If, we, if there were a re-elected national government and it start using the powers that are there under the SERA to start selling off the assets of Christchurch, you will have civil outbreaks on your hands that you would not believe. Christchurch knows, people of Christchurch know, those assets have delivered long term. One of them alone, Orion, 
has delivered $980 million in dividends, nearly a billion dollars in dividends, to the ratepayers of Christchurch over the last 20 years. We know through this budget explicitly the government will, if re-elected, embark on an asset sales program next year, next year, there in black and white. And if you think it's bad enough putting into hock the SOEs like Meridian, Mighty River and Genesis, you will see nothing in comparison in terms of public revolt if you try to sell the assets of Christchurch. Sam Lotto,